afraid I haven't got a fancy clicker like Graham, so I'm going to have to uh, go over there to change the slides myself. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk a bit more about, well, this is Social Media Cafe, so I want to talk about, tell you a story about how I got into podcasting and how social media was you know, in integral in that, really, and how it led me into podcasting. Um, so, yeah, my name's Dan Lynch, as you can see on there. Um, some of you know me, I know quite a few of you. Um, but I do a number of different podcasts, and uh, I'll just have to excuse me a sec. There we go. So I'm going to tell you a little quick bit about me to start with. This, um, I hope this presentation isn't too self-indulgent, because it is. I didn't realize Graham was going to do his kind of story of podcasting, so it may be a little bit similar in some places. Um, so I'm going to tell you very quickly, just very quickly, about what I do and who I am, because some of that will come into the story as well. So um, I do, uh, I'm a podcaster, digital media producer, based in Liverpool. I'm also a musician, uh, writer, and uh, I put recovering web developer, because I don't do that as much anymore. <laughs> but uh, I still do bits of web development stuff as well. Uh, I'm a big kind of open source and free software geek, particularly Linux, which is why I put the Linux Penguin on there, but we'll get more into that in a second. And uh, I also, yeah, that's, I just do that on there. That's my band's kind of EP. That, that's a bit of gratuitous self-promotion. Um, so, yeah, as I said, I want to tell you about how I got into uh, podcasting and how social media was uh, really, really important in that. I'm going to take this mic off the stand, actually, because then I can... Give me a sec. Um, oh, there we go. Don't worry, I'm not going to start rapping or anything. <laughs> I'm afraid not, no. You don't want to see that or hear that. Uh, so, let's move on. Okay. So, yeah, I want to tell you a story. And uh, I want to tell you there's a little cast in this story. Um, it's not a pun. It's a pun there. Um, I want to tell you a bit about the cast of the story that we'll get into in a minute. So, our story involves uh, a TV presenter, a Hollywood director, uh, a German history student, and some random guys from Finland. <laughs> They'll come on to it later. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to take you back. This is very similar to Graham, actually. I'm going to take you back to 2006. Seems to be very 2006 themed tonight, for some reason. Um, so that's when um, I first became aware of podcasts. And um, I'm assuming, I was going to ask you if you all knew what podcasts were, but Graham's talked about it at length now. So does anybody here listen to podcasts? I'm sure. Any show of hands? Neil does. Cool. So I'm going to assume that you know what podcasts are. Um, and we'll, we'll skip over that. Um, so way back in 2006, uh, kind of mid to end of 2006, uh, when Graham was already doing podcasts, I didn't really know what they were. Uh, and I came across a podcast, um, a podcast called a Twit. Does anyone know who this fella is here? I know some people do. I know Don does. <laughs> but uh, this fella is a guy by the name of Leo Laporte. And um, he's a, a journalist, radio presenter, a TV presenter, speaker, uh, all kinds of things, author, and so on. And uh, he used to do a thing called Tech TV in America, which was a uh, TV, uh, TV station that dealt with computer things, uh, all kinds of you know, tips. So he used to do a show called Screen Savers, which was tips where people would phone in. He does a thing called The Tech Guy, uh, which is a radio show in America, where people phone in with tech problems and things like that. And I became aware of a show that he does called Twit, This Week in Tech. And Twit is, is still going today. It's massive. We'll talk about, about that later on. And I became aware of that as a listener at first. And I also became aware of, I'm sure most of you don't know who these guys are, um, I also became aware of a show called Lug Radio, which is all about Linux and free software, which is a big thing for me. So I started listening to podcasts and getting into it that way. And then in 2007, uh, I became a big, big fan of a show called Smodcast, which is where another of our... Uh, by the way, Leo's the TV presenter in our story. Uh, we'll get more into that in a bit. And uh, which involves our Hollywood director, a guy called Kevin Smith. Um, some of you might know him. Uh, he's done quite a few uh, big films and so on. And he directed Clerks. Uh, it was his big kind of breakthrough film. And he started a show called Smodcast in uh, early 2007. And uh, it's still going today, a lot bigger now. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So I became a fan of that. And uh, gradually, you know, I uh, listened to a lot more podcasts and got into it. Now, at the time, uh, being that this is Social Media Cafe, I need to talk about a, bit, a little bit about social media, I was a complete Luddite in some senses that I didn't at all use any social media. Um, Twitter was around, I believe, or it was kind of kicking off. Uh, people were talking about it. Leo Laporte used to talk about it a lot. 
But for some reason, I just had no interest. I don't know why, but it just didn't appeal to me. And um, I didn't have any kind of engagement. I used forums and chat rooms and things, but I didn't use what we know today as social media. Until uh, one of Leo Laporte's shows called Net at Night, which is uh, one of the shows on his network at the time, he uh, had an interesting legal uh, problem in that his uh, show is called Twit This Week in Tech. And uh, understandably, I think a lot of people confuse that with Twitter because, you know, it sounds similar. And people thought it was like part of the name or something. And he was advised by his lawyers that uh, he should leave Twitter because he has to defend his copyright. Um, I'm not completely au fait with the UK, uh, UK US law in uh, copyright and so on. But you have to actively defend your trademarks and things like that. In, under US law. So he was advised by his lawyers to stop using Twitter because of the naming similarities. And I was listening to his show and he moved to a thing called Jaiku, which is now defunct. It's disappeared, sadly. Um, I don't know if anyone... Did anyone know Jaiku? Did anyone ever use it? Anyone heard of it? Adrian used it? Okay. So it obviously didn't, didn't become as popular as I would have, would have hoped. But he talked about Jaiku. He moved to Jaiku. And at the time, Jaiku was a tiny little site. Um, it's, it is Finnish. This is where our random Finnish guys come into the story. Uh, it was started by some guys from Nokia, another great Finnish company. And uh, they, they left Nokia and they started this uh, social media site, this social network kind of thing called Jaiku. And Jaiku, as you can probably see, this is a little screenshot of it. Um, it was a, little, a bit like Twitter, really, very similar in a lot of ways. Um, but it, it worked slightly differently in that uh, you would post what they would call jikus, which were a bit like tweets or, on Twitter, but um, they, would, they didn't have comments on those, um, on those jikus, and the comments didn't have any limit on the number of characters. So they became like forum threads, where um, the first post, so yay, I'm going for, to Thailand for two weeks, <laughs> would then become uh, the start of a conversation. And that was the idea of jiku, was every post was the start of a conversation. And to this day, I've never found, quite found another site that matches that. I mean, Twitter's not really like that. I mean, you can kind of have conversation with people on Twitter, and I do that, but you're always limited to 140 characters, and it's a little bit difficult. But this became more like uh, kind of a forum, if you like. So I got into Jaiku, first uh, foray into social media. And uh, through Jaiku, I met lots of other people who were listening to Twit and getting into podcasts and stuff like that. And um, I got more and more into Jaiku and uh, into social media. And uh, through Jaiku, I was led back to podcasts, but at this time um, as a creator of podcasts. And um, I met some friends there from all over the world on Jaiku, uh, some in Australia, America, all over Europe. And uh, one night, late one night, as you do, you know, I was uh, probably up too late posting stupid things on Jaiku about what I'd eaten for dinner and stuff like that. All the important stuff that we like to post on, on social media. And uh, we used to talk a lot about all kinds of things. And somebody made a joke that we were the most ineffectual group of superheroes and that uh, we could save the world, but we just generally couldn't be asked. Um, and that was something that kind of came out of it. And I came up with this name, and I called it Feeble Force. That was our, my name for our stupid kind of imaginary group of superheroes on Jaiku. And, uh, and somebody said, we should do a podcast. And I thought, well, okay, maybe we could try that. And uh, very quickly I registered feebleforce.com. I grabbed this as the original site, <laughs> believe it or not. This was the site, the self feeble we were. Um, I just grabbed an old envelope and wrote it on it and put, you know, come in soon if we can be bothered. Uh, and threw that up. And within the space of uh, a month or so, we started doing shows. And... Uh, it grew quite, quite quickly, actually. Um, we, we did a, a one main show, which was a bit like Twit, and we all got together on Skype, uh, and we just recorded it, our conversations, uh, cut them together. I did some music, uh, theme music and stuff, to go with it. Uh, and we had, at the time, it, this was uh, early 2007, we had, I mean, it, it became more and more popular since, but we had, like, five hosts, say, on any one show. One of them would be in Australia, Another one, maybe two, would be in America. I'd be in the UK, other people in mainland Europe, or one at the same time. And it worked surprisingly well, just over Skype, um, which was amazing. So we recorded it, and the thing grew, and other people said, oh, I want to join. And we ended up spinning off with different shows as well. The guys in North America 
uh, because of the time difference, sometimes find it difficult to, to join you know, uh, and record with us at the same time. So they span off and did their own show, which we called New World Disorder, uh, which again was more just kind of rambling and uh, technology talk and strange, quirky news stories and things like that. So that all kind of grew. <clears throat> and that's how I got into, into podcasting at first. And that grew quite quickly. And then through Jaiku again, um, I, uh, I, I met, uh, this, this is my co-host, I do a show called Linux Outlaws, and this is my co-host, he's our German history student in the story. Uh, I met uh, Fab, who's my co-host on Linux Outlaws, and um, we talked a bit on Jaiku, he came on as a guest on uh, some of the Feeble Force shows, and uh, we talked about Linux and stuff like that, and the fact that we wanted to do a show about it, so he suggested why don't we do a show about Linux. So I thought, yeah, okay, why not? And we started this thing called Linux Outlaws in August to September 2007. Now, I didn't really think we were groundbreaking at the time. And looking at Graham's story, he was well away by this time in his podcast story. So we certainly weren't, and I know there were lots of podcasters around by then. But we started off, and um, at first I think we had about, I don't know, 30 or 40 listeners. And we were quite pleased with that. <laughs> and then we thought, that's quite cool. And um, I think at the start we said we'd have been happy if we could get to 100 listeners. Um, and the show has, has kind of continued over the last few years, uh, still going today. And today we have something like 30, 000, 25 to 30,000 listeners. Um, so we grew a little bit more than 100, which was nice. Uh, but the weird thing is, uh, I don't know if anyone else or any other podcasters will attest to this, but uh, you kind of reset the goals. What happens is you say, oh, 100 listeners would be amazing, wouldn't it? You know, I'd, I'd you know, die and gone to heaven if I got 100 listeners. So then you get 100 listeners and you think, well, I'm not going to be happy until I get 200, really. Um, you know, I can't really be happy with that. And then you get to 200, and then you think 300, and then before you know it, you're like, 10,000 listeners, I'm not getting out of bed for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, you become a prima donna. Not always. Um, so, oh, sorry, this slide. I don't think we need that slide. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I just told you, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I met Fab on there, and we continued as the show's gone on. Uh, we do live events and all kinds of things. And then I began producing uh, shows for other people, as you can see. I started producing a show called Software Freedom Law uh, Show, pardon me, um, for some guys in New York who are uh, uh, lawyers, free software lawyers. And then in 2009, um, I started a music show in um, kind of early 2009. And the original name of the show, our Feeble Force show, was called Rat Hole Radio. And... Uh, I came to do a music show, and Rat Hole Radio was sadly defunct by then, the original one. And we'd all kind of gone our separate ways. And I decided to use the name, because I'm too lazy to think of another name, really. And I thought it was quite cool, <laughs> so I grabbed it. Um, does anyone know what a rat hole is? Anyone know? Uh, in, in kind of podcasting or radio terms? No? Nobody does. Okay, that's cool, because I can tell you. Uh, basically, a rat hole is, uh, as you can tell, we're podcasters, I talk a lot. And... Uh, a rat hole is when you kind of go off on a tangent. When you're talking about a subject and uh, you go off on a mad tangent for 10 minutes and then somebody goes, oh, that was a bit of a rat hole. And it became this kind of meme in the podcasting world. Um, and uh, that's why I called it Rat Hole Radio, because I tend to ramble. And uh, it fit well. So Rat Hole Radio came back in 2009 uh, as a music show. And that's still going today and uh, doing reasonably well. Uh, it's not, not quite as big as Linux Outlaws in listener terms. But, uh, you know, it's getting there. And that's still going. So that came back in 2009, and that's continued. And then, in 2010, things came full circle for me, really, because um, I actually joined the Twit Network, which was the first, thing, first podcast I'd ever listened to was Twit. And somehow, I ended up uh, on the Twit Network. And uh, I was asked to co-host a show called Floss Weekly, which is about open source software and free software and so on. And I joined that in 2010, and I still do it today. And uh, that's a video show as well. Uh, it's all done over Skype. Uh, this is Simon, Simon Phipps, who's one of the other hosts. And that's me, kind of in my little studio at home. Um, and uh, it's a video show as well, and we do that, um, we do that weekly. As you would guess from the name, last weekly. Um, but we, we do that weekly, and we interview uh, projects, free software, open source projects, every week. So that was amazing to, to come from a place where I just listened to these guys and they kind of inspired me and then to be asked to almost you know, join the fold if you like was, uh, was very cool. So 
This is going a lot faster than I thought it would, actually. <laughs> but um, let's talk about, you know, where are they now, our protagonists, if you like. So this is Leo Laporte again, obviously. And uh, he, actually, uh, this is a point where we're going to have to disagree with something that Graham was saying about people not making money out of pockets. And it, it is rare, but uh, Leo's Twit network is massive now. They've got, I don't know, 40 shows or something like that. Um, they've got over a million dollar turnover. Um, he does a lot of, I mean, a lot of it's through advertising um, and other things. And he also has subscribers who subscribe to, uh, to donate money each month and so on. Um, so he's, he just built a brand new studio and their, their turnover's in the millions and so on. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to claim that that's, you know, you know, that's at all the usual story for podcasters, but it is possible. Um, Kevin Smith, uh, the director I talked about, uh, his Smartcast show is still going. And uh, it's now a network itself. It's expanded into a network. And uh, his shows get like you know, a million downloads or something crazy. And he does big live tours all around the world. Now, that's a bit unfair to say that you could do that just off starting a podcast because he was famous already, and that probably helped. A bit like the Ricky Gervais argument. Um, but, he, yeah, that's grown into a massive thing. And he's actually announced uh, early this year that he's given up film directing to be a full-time podcaster because he prefers podcasting. Um, I don't know if I would make the same choice if I was a, a successful film director, but um, yeah, he, he prefers uh, doing live shows and uh, you know going on stage in front of crowds. He does work tours all over the world. He was in Manchester recently in Glasgow and places selling out. You know, uh, I think it was the Apollo in Manchester. They sold out uh, all kinds of places. So he's going to do that full time, and uh, he's started this thing called Sir Spontcast Internet Radio, which is 24-hour streaming as well, and they've got all kinds of shows on there. Um, these guys, you're not going to really be able to tell you. These is the original um, founders of Jaiku, which was the site that I loved so much back then. And Jaiku was bought by Google, which was great news for these guys, probably, but uh, wasn't such great news for, for us kind of Jaiku users. Because uh, what very quickly happened was the, the, the Jaiku founders uh, were put onto other jobs by Google. They didn't really want Jaiku, they wanted the people who'd made it. And Jaiku kind of faded out after about a year after Google bought it. And it's actually just officially closed, although it had been kind of unofficially dead for a while. Um, but they all moved to San Francisco, made millions of dollars, so they're doing all right. But um, unfortunately, Jaiku didn't, uh, didn't survive. And then uh, this is my co-host again, uh, Fab. He's just uh, started working for a company called The H, uh, Heiser Online, who are a big German uh, big German um, media uh, publisher, and they do like news and uh, news service basically. But um, they do an English version, which he started writing for. Um, which, to be honest, is probably um, a lot to do with podcasting because it's given him a kind of platform to, you know, to, to the people know him in the, in the kind of the Linux world and uh, enabled him to get that kind of uh, boost into the job. Um, as for me, well, I'm still here. I haven't got millions of dollars, unfortunately, or pounds, or whatever currency you like. Um, but I'm still around. And I still do all these shows as well. I mean, I'm doing Floss Weekly, Rattle Radio, uh, Linux Outdoors. Uh, still producing uh, a show for the guys in America, which is called Free and Freedom now. And um, I do production services for people through a thing called podfactory.org, uh, producing shows for other people. And um, this is the part where I kind of want to, I kind of want to espouse the virtues of podcasting, because... I mean, while you may not make a fortune off it, um, Graham kind of said how enjoyable it is, and it definitely is. Um, but it's enabled me to do things that I never would have imagined. So this, I'm sure a lot of you know this gentleman, uh, Alexi Sale. He was on Rat Hole Radio last year. Uh, that's me and him, uh, just before the interview. Uh, so I got to meet him and sit down with him for like half an hour and have this amazing conversation with one of my heroes, which I probably wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't started that podcast all those years ago. Um, so it helped a lot in that sense, and I got to, I've been you know, invited to events in other countries and um, you know, given like, flights and things, which is cool, to meet all, you know, all kinds of people that I probably never would have met without starting podcasting. Um, I didn't mention it before, but um, as part of Linux Outlaws, we do uh, an event called OgCamp, which is now the UK's biggest Linux event. I have to talk to Dave about marketing. I need to push that more. That's the line. UK's biggest Linux event. Um, but we, we do it every year. And last year we had uh, 400 people came along. Uh, some from other parts of the world. Some from America, which I found mind-blowing. That you know, Because I started this podcast, somebody decided to get on a plane from 
uh, New York and come over and visit, which is just bizarre. But um, I'm very grateful that they did. And that's kind of grown out of there as well. So, um, yeah, so why should you be interested in podcasting? Okay, well, I've told you how I got into it and, uh, and my story in that sense. Um, but, I mean, podcasting, it's becoming more a part of the mainstream media these days. Um, these are just some rough examples, but the BBC do quite a lot of podcasts. Um, obviously, they're set up for that, being already radio, TV producers and so on. Um, so they're pushing a lot of this stuff into podcasts. People like Ricky Gervais are doing really well out of it. The Guardian do a lot of successful podcasts. And it's becoming more a part of the mainstream media these days. And the, the really great thing about it, I, I think, is you can start doing it without forking out a load of money for expensive equipment or you know, having to go and get a posh studio and stuff like that. I mean, obviously those things help, but if you just want to get started, you've got a microphone, you've got a computer, uh, you've got something you want to talk about, an idea, why not try it? Put it on the internet. If nobody likes it, then what have you lost? You've, you've, got, the, you know, you've got to make your podcast and uh, you got to do it. So I would encourage everyone to give it a go. Um, it certainly helped a lot. It's given me a lot of opportunities that I wouldn't have got otherwise, um, which, is, which is great. And as I say, it, it's, pretty, it's very cheap to get into, um, and who knows where it could go. I was going to be happy with you know, 30 people listening to our show, and now it's like 30,000. So who knows where it can go. So just give it a go. Um, that was incredibly short. That felt really short. I didn't time it when I, when I, was, when I was preparing for this. Uh, but I suppose it gives us more time for questions. So um, I hope you enjoyed the story, and thank you for listening. And if you have got any questions, then fire away. It's getting a bit hard to see because you know, of the because of the lights. But does anybody have any questions about uh, podcasting or anything else? Really, I don't mind. No. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, hello. They're all. So let's do it in order. Sorry, Eddie. Go. Yeah, I mean, that's what I do with Rattle Radio. I mean, the thing with, because I'm not on a you know, commercial station or whatever, I don't have a, pro, a program director telling me what music I can play and what I can't. The real reason I, I, I started doing Rattle Radio was just because I wanted to play music that I liked. And Rattle Radio, I didn't really highlight it there, but it's all independent music, and I go out and meet musicians and um, interview them and get live sessions and stuff. And um, that really helps with, I mean, I don't play kind of mainstream music, if you like, partly because that already gets played. So what am I going to do that somebody else isn't going to do with, with mainstream kind of commercial radio? Um, so I like being able to play individual music and highlight artists that maybe wouldn't get, you know, wouldn't get that exposure otherwise, which is really cool. Um, so we had some other questions. There was one here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go on. Which, which um, have you most enjoyed doing it? Which type of podcast? Uh, which type of podcast? Um, I don't know, really. I mean, well, it's, it's a strange one, because Linux Outlaws is often, like, two hours long these days. We've done, like, 260... What well, I should know this. 262 episodes now. There's that one, the last one isn't quite out yet. But we've done 262 episodes, and that's, like, two hours of just talking to a friend, you know, on, on, a, on a Monday night. We broadcast the show live via uh, Icecast, um, streaming, and we also do. We used to do a lot of video streaming. We haven't. We've kind of stopped doing that now, but we probably will get back into it because uh, I haven't really talked about the technical side of it. But um, we we got upset with Flash basically because it was annoying, <laughs> and we stopped doing the video streaming. But um, I love doing all kinds of shows. It's it's probably I, I would say doing show. Or I do Rattle Radio on my own. I think doing a show with someone else is probably more enjoyable, just because. It's nice to have some company, I suppose. And a conversation's always better when there's someone else involved. <laughs> I find, anyway. Um, so I hope that kind of answers it a little bit. Um, I think Alex had a question. But you mentioned part of it, you do the live streaming, and then there's also IRC, sort of mm. feedback, sort of thing. I suppose that's the social side. There. Yeah, I mean, after talking about social media and saying I was going to really work that in, I didn't, did I, apart from Jaiku? Um, we do, yeah, we have, because we broadcast the show live, we, have, um, we use IRC for chat. Uh, and we usually have about 100 people or so 
um, maybe sometimes a few more, when we're doing the live uh, show. So the really great thing about that is, because we, ne- we didn't always do Linux Outlaws live, we started doing that um, about a year or two into the show. And um, the, the great thing about that was that <laughs> we often get things wrong. And, uh, you know, nobody's perfect, but we'd often get things wrong. And um, in the old days, what would happen is, I say the old days, this is before we did it live, um, we'd say something that was wrong, and then we'd get an email, like two weeks later, from someone who downloaded it saying, did you know you were wrong about this? And then give us a big, you know, telling off. Whereas now what tends to happen is we say something that's wrong, and a window pops up going, you're wrong! <laughs> like, straight away. And, of course, there's that feedback. And then it's great. And you can, people can give requests and stuff like that. And we do use, um, we use Google+, and Twitter, and... Um, you know, uh, Facebook, all those kind of things to, to engage with people and find out what people want to hear and what their kind of opinions are and stuff. And, and it's really, really cool. And people actually, the weird thing is we haven't really, I didn't talk about the technical side of it so much, but because my co-host for the next hour is, is in uh, Bonn in Germany, obviously we can't record together in the same place. So we still talk over, uh, we don't use Skype these days, we're using Google Hangouts, um, but we still talk over the internet. And um, in order to make the audio quality the best that it can be, because I didn't really like Skype sounds fairly good, but I didn't like the um, the sound of you know one of us being on almost on a phone, if you like, uh, it wasn't very good. So what we do is we talk live over Skype, but we both record locally at the same time, and then after that uh, he sends me his recording, uploads it, and I cut them together, uh, which is really simple. I, I sync them up and then cut the show together. So it sounds like we're in the same room, and people don't know. It's hardly, it's not a groundbreaking thing. It's an idea I came up with in about 2000, late 2007. I didn't realize at the time, much like podcasting, everyone was already doing it. Um, I thought I'd invented this great new thing. But I mean, radio stations and other people have done that for a while. Um, But since we started doing that, a lot of other kind of big shows, more famous shows than ours, have copied our technique to some degree, which is quite nice. It's quite nice to know that that's... Uh, popular and yeah, social media. I've gone way off the point here. I've rat holed it, but uh, so sh- social media is definitely a big part of it. If yeah, break it back in. Um, somebody else put their hand up here. Software um, for video type stuff. Um, yeah, well, I'm as I mentioned, I'm a, a big. Um, Linux and free software guy, uh, open source guy. So I use, uh, this is Ubuntu, the uh, operating system that I use, um, which is a version, this is getting really technical now, which is a, a version of Linux, essentially. I'm trying to get you to the desktop so you can actually see. Uh, let me close those. There you go. Um, so I use, we use Linux on Linux Outlaws because otherwise, you know, it would be a bit silly for us to tell everyone how great Linux is and then not use it. Um, so we use, we use Linux, but I actually use, um, to record the show, we use uh, Google Hangouts, which you can choose through any web browser uh, these days. We did use Skype originally to talk to each other. Uh, we don't use Skype uh, these days. We're using Google Hangouts. And if you're on Google+, Plus, which I encourage everyone to try because it's very cool, um, you can do that really easily. You can host Hangouts. You can have private Hangouts. So between like the two of us um, and fingers crossed in the next kind of year or so they've already got a broadcasting platform in place to broadcast the video and so on because they're going to do YouTube Live, it's all owned by Google uh, they're going to do a thing called uh, YouTube Live um, that may not be the, the strict name of it but uh, it's going to enable people to, to stream live through live.youtube.com and that's already plumbed in to uh, Google Plus and Google Hangouts but they just keep saying they're testing it and they're not enabled yet. So we do that, and when it comes to kind of post-production, um, I use Audacity, a program called Audacity, which is free uh, to edit it. And the reason I use it is because it's open source program, it's, it's free software in the political sense, which I won't get into. Uh, but it's, uh, it's open source and it's free, and uh, it's, it's great for that kind of stuff. And then we, we put it, I put it all together with uh, Audacity, produce uh, two versions of the show. I don't know. Uh, produced two versions of the show at the end, which Graham kind of mentioned before. Uh, just one in MP3 and one in uh, OG, which is another uh, audio format, a free audio format. Um, and then they just go up onto the website. Um, we use Libsyn, which Graham mentioned. Um, I still use Libsyn. I've, I didn't know that you could get a free deal if you're in AMP. Um, I'm in AMP. I'm a member of AMP. I'm associated with music podcasting, which Graham mentioned. But I joined quite late. I, I joined um, 2010. And... Um, 
I already had a Libsyn account, and it cost ten dollars a month, ten US dollars, um, and for that they take care of all bandwidth costs and so on. Um, so it doesn't matter to me if you know a hundred people or a hundred thousand people download the show; it's not going to cost me anymore. I just pay them the ten dollars, and then they deal with it, which is cool. Um, and that's a big thing that we ran into because we we did host the show. I hosted the show on my web server, uh, Linux Outlaws. This is when we first started. And then I realized it was getting too popular, <laughs> and uh, I couldn't handle it anymore on, on the server. So we, we did that, and um, I pay, yeah, as I say, $10 a month, really easy to do. Um, and it kind of, yeah, it kind of works. I mean, I haven't gone into the full production kind of thing of it, but um, I, can, I can do that some other time if people want me to. But um, yeah, it's, made, it's all produced with Linux and free software, which is great, which is a big political point for me. <laughs> um, I hope that answers it a little bit. Yeah. Um, wow, okay. Um, well, really, that's a personal choice. I don't, um, this is where I have to get, like, like a politician and kind of try and answer that in the least offensive way. I, um, well, okay, fair enough. Um, I, I would, uh, I would say, try it, try it. Don't, you don't have to take it off. You don't have to take Windows 7 off. You can dual boot with Ubuntu or something and have a look at it. Or maybe use another machine, like if you've got another machine or an older machine. You can try that. Um, I think it's down to the individual, what they want to use. I don't mind you know, what people use, if it's Windows or Mac or anything else. That's cool. That's their decision. Um, I use Linux for ideological reasons um, because I believe in free software and in open source and collaboration between people and I like the fact that Linux is made by you know, hundreds of thousands of people all around the world collaborating um, as a kind of a bit of a lefty that appeals to me um, rather than getting at Windows. There's nothing wrong with Windows or, or Apple or anything else if that's what you want to use. I, I would encourage people to give it a go. You can get um, you can get yourself a, a CD, you can download the image from, uh, if you go to Ubuntu.com, you can download the, the image and burn a CD, or you can actually order a CD and they'll send you one for free, um, which you can put in your machine and boot it from the CD and try it out. And in that, you don't actually install it onto your system, you're not changing anything, you're not breaking anything, and if you don't like it, you take the CD out and you think, oh, I'm not going to use that again. And, and that's fine. Um, I would just like people to try it, really. That's my thing. If you, don't, if you try it and you don't like it, that's cool. But you can't say you don't like it if you've never tried it. <laughs> that makes sense. That was quite political, wasn't it? Sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's a technically good question, but is there a, is like a podcasting version of Ofcom? Is there anybody you can actually... Like a regulator? Yeah, is there anybody you can get in trouble with? Uh, not that I know of. No? Um, No, I don't, not that I know of. I mean, our show, Linux Outlaws, is not um, work safe. We, we swear at times. It's not big and it's not clever, but we do it. Um, we all do it now and again. Don't say you don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we do swear at times and we do things like that, but we've never got in trouble with it other than, I suppose, for me, we're accountable to our listeners, really, and I want to make sure that they like listening to the show and they get something from it, and as long as they like the show, that's what I kind of care about. Um, I mean, there was a question before about have anyone got, uh, have people got into trouble for playing commercial music on uh, podcasts? And it's definitely, there's definitely a legal liability if you do that. But I've, I'm not going to encourage you all to go out and do it. If you want to, that's fine. It's for you. But um, I've never heard of anybody, to my knowledge, being um, sued or sent a cease and desist order for doing a podcast with music in it that was under copyright. And I'm not suggesting you go and do that, but I'm just saying that for some reason, it doesn't seem to be on the radar of the um, media providers, you know, record companies and so on. Because not many people um, are going to, you know, go and download a podcast and then try and get the music out of it and put it on their iPod and stuff like that. It just doesn't seem worth it. It's far more easier to go to somewhere like Pirate Bay and just download it. So that's why probably that's their focus right now. Um, it's, it's a lot easier. I mean, back in... Back, um, Back in the you know days of my childhood, I did. I think like a lot of us sit there with the radio and the tape cassette, going like press record and play, just try and get it. Just DJ talking, try and cut it out, um, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't. Ha I don't know of people doing that nowadays. It's easier to just go to YouTube and rip the sound off that, or go and get it off Pirate Bay. Does Kevin Smith did that right? I mean, he's always been doing that. Whenever he's 
playing music. Yeah, they stopped that a little while ago. Though. Yeah, they did stop it. Um, yeah, Kevin Smith, who I talked about, he was the film director who does Smodcast and Smodcast Network. Um, originally, during the show, they used to just play music in the background, commercial music. Um, I think Ken Plume was the guy who did it, who's like produces their show. Um, he would mix in a music track, and he would try and make the music something funny, you know, that was related to what they were talking about. Um, and they stopped that a little while ago, but I don't think they stopped it because they were warned to, I think, or told to. Um, he didn't even have a theme, show, a theme song for the show or anything. And they decided to make their own theme song and try and have an identity of their own. And then they stopped doing the, uh, doing the music behind. But I don't think it was for legal reasons, though. I don't know exactly. Yep. Yeah, I mean, one of the problems, the big problem with podcasting and music rights is that the legal framework is not set up to accommodate something like podcasts because um, I know a lot of people know about you getting a PRS license. I know Eddie will know about this for radio or something. You have to get yourself your PRS license and you renew it periodically for you in order for you to broadcast you know, copyrighted music. But the problem with the podcast is, podcasts, as you know, are a, you know, a file that's uploaded somewhere. And I don't know, I mean, I leave all my shows on there, so people can, I do occasionally get emails off people who listen to a show that was four years old or five years old or something that's still on there. Uh, under the PRS system, I, they won't give me a license to put music online in perpetuity like that if that makes sense. So um, if I'm doing live broadcasts and that's all, that's fine. I broadcast today, I've got a license right now. I broadcast, I stop broadcasting, I'm legally covered. If I record that broadcast and you download it three years' time, at which time I've completely stopped podcasting altogether or not even doing it anymore, that's not legally covered because I haven't got a license at that point. So they, they just won't, they will only license for a set broadcast time. So what they do is, I forget what the period is, but you have to take your podcasts offline after a certain amount of time. If you use a PRS license, um, they will give you a license for, say, a year, at which point it's your responsibility to go and take off all the shows that are over a year old because you don't now, you're not now legally allowed to have them on there, which is why I've never bothered playing copyrighted music, not least because I want to highlight independent artists and creative commons, which is a big kind of passion of mine as well, but it's mainly because I think it's just so stupid that they can't get their heads around this new kind of form of media. Um, I think maybe it will happen, I don't know, but the legal framework is not set up for it right now. Someone at the back? Yeah, um, just to sort of compare, like, uh, Battle Radio and Billy Battle, what kind of like, man hours are it for you to want? To do them? Um, yeah. it, it is quite a lot of effort. I mean, Graham talked before about um, the amount of cost in time, if you like, that it takes to do the show. Um, Linux Outlaws, um, we, we do two hours. Um, we've always, I don't know if we've been lucky, I know of other podcasters who will record for like five hours and cut it down to two hours and spend ages doing that. We never did that, we just started, press record, talked for two hours and stopped. Um, now it's not to say that we don't edit it, because we do quite intensively, but um, we didn't, we were able to just do the show kind of in one take if you like and then and we'd go back and change it later on. I, I've, I've, over the years, it, it, I've found that it takes roughly, so for like half an hour of a finished show, say finished, edited and everything, it usually takes me about twice that length of time to edit it. So if I'm going to do an hour show, it will take me sometimes two hours to edit it. Um, that's just because the way I edit, I'm a complete perfectionist in that sense. <laughs> I don't know why, uh, but I, I will go through and cut out, you know, bits where we talk over each other when we shouldn't have done or when things have gone wrong. Um, but at the same time, because we broadcast live, people record it live and they share it amongst themselves, uh, like straight off the stream, so it's unedited, which I have no problem with. If that's what they want to do, great, go for it. Um, the audio quality isn't as good. Um, but that's, you know, as I say before, it's down to the listener. If that's what they want, that's cool. And there are kind of versions, it's weird, almost pirate versions of our show, um, <laughs> which, isn't, which aren't pirate versions because, you know, they're perfectly free to do that under the license that we use. Uh, but people do take the show and remix it and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, but it does take a lot of time. I mean, with Rattle Radio, the most amount of time is taken up probably finding music, um, searching for new music, which I do through 
many different services. Uh, like I think Graham mentioned Jumando. Jumando is amazing uh, if you haven't been on there. Uh, that all the music on Jumando is Creative Commons licensed, so it's already you know pod safe if you like, so you can play it on podcasts. Um, and there's a lot of other shows that I listen to, and people send me stuff, which is amazing. And um, in a kind of a, uh, a you know, I don't know, a, 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 a not so good John Peel fashion, I kind of go through them. And that's you know that's my kind of goal to be as, as good as him. But um, is you know I go through and listen to the submissions if I like them, then great, and I'll put them in this playlist, contact people. Um, I would say probably a, a day or two a week I probably spend on podcasting. But in contrast to I mean there was talk before about someone asked can you make money out of podcasting? I forget who it was, uh, and Graham said you can't. And I'm not going to tell you that you're going to get rich off podcasting. Um, I'm not rich from podcasting, but the shows pay for themselves. Um, so the, ho- the hosting costs are all covered by donations from listeners. Um, I don't do advertising at the moment. Um, not because I'm massively against it ideologically, but just because uh, I, I would have to be, it would have to be a, a, um, a sponsor that I felt comfortable promoting. I'm not going to promote someone that I don't agree with. So you know, I'm not going to promote Benetton or something, um, or something that I disagree with, um, because I, you know, I don't need the money that much. And, and that's all about, I suppose, personal choice. But you can actually make a living out of it, and people do. And people who weren't famous before they started podcasting also make a living out of it. Um, I mean, as I say, we've got about 30,000 listeners, and we don't, the show is free. It's completely free for people to download. We don't charge for it, and we never will. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people, uh, we have PayPal accounts, and we, have a, we use a thing called Flatter. If you haven't seen Flatter, it's a social micropayment site. Um, fits quite well with the whole social media cafe thing. Um, and what Flatter does is um, you sign up for an account and then um, you set the amount that you want to put in your Flatter account each month. So I have, I don't know, 10 euros. It's in euros for some reason. Uh, so I, I put, say, 10 euros into my Flatter account each month. Um, and then once I've done that, I have a Flatter account. And lots of different sites have what they call a the Flatter button. And if I like the site and I want to you know, chip them a little bit of money, I press the Flatter button. And what it does is uh, I can press that button or different buttons on as many sites as I want, and it divides my 10 euros by the number of clicks and gives it to them individually. So I'm not paying more than 10 euros ever. Um, So if I click on one thing a month, they've done well, they're going to get the whole 10 euros. Um, But if I click on 100 things, you know, they'll all get a little fraction of that. Um, And Flatter has started, it started off quite slowly. Um, but it's actually grown really pop to be quite popular now, and it's growing all the time. Um, it's in true uh, Web 2.0 kind of sense. It's, it's flatter, spelt without an E, so it's F L A T T R dot com. But it's well worth looking at, and that gives uh, a surprising amount of income as well. And I think, from my point of view, I mean, I, I really enjoy podcasting, and it does give some income for me. It doesn't make a fortune, but it does. It does give me enough income to pay for the time that I spend on it, and the hosting costs and stuff, and, you know, who doesn't want to get paid to do something they enjoy? So I think, yeah, the amount of time, it, it is considerable. It's probably one, two days a week of, of work, but um, I'm quite happy to do it at the moment.